Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming to this first and introductory panel to Nizami Gajavi Symposium, organized together with the Italian Society for International Organization. I am very pleased to see all of you here after a very emotioning audience to the Pope Francis earlier this morning, and uh, we start by addressing one of the most important, from my point of view, issues that are at stake today. What about the future of Europe? Future of Europe is, of course, means to talk about the present, and the perspectives for the future of European institutions. You know, we, we have seen just the appointment of the European Commission and the positive perspective the European Commission gets a green light from the European Parliament after some critical political events that led to the replacement of some of the members of the newly appointed European Commission. And we have also some uh, important debates about uh, what is European Union plan to do in the future according to the principles of the treaties, but also in light of the perspective of changing the structure and or the treaties of European Union. You know that uh, yesterday has been circulated by a Franco-German proposal the idea of establishing a convention or conference, whatever it will be called, for the future of Europe. A conference that in the intentions should be established soon, already at the European Council that will meet next month, mid-December, and already in that date, there should be the possibility to have on the table a proposal on some key points that should be the keys for this new convention or uh, conference to uh, be addressed in the next two years. This, com this commission convention or conference should be working for the next two years and then present a proposal in the midst of the current term of the European Commission and European Parliament in order to give the institutions the possibility if they will agree to transform the proposal into some practical action. So, all of this is, uh, I think, a, a key point for those like me that are strongly in favor of further European integration in many different areas, political integration as well as economic and security integration. And since our today and tomorrow's uh, symposium is dealing, is talking, uh, will be talking about uh, some of those extremely important topics, how to prevent escalation of crisis, how to block the tendency to proliferation, including nuclear proliferation, how to strengthen a comprehensive a vision of security, security that, of course, doesn't know any borders, security and those that are against the fundamental rights of people don't know any kind of borders to commit crime, to expand tendencies of dominating activities at the expenses of others. So, all those is in the concept, the political concept of how Europe is further integrating. 
will Europe be able to build, I add, finally, a serious proposal for a common defense and security strategy, especially in a moment where not only from our American allies, but also from within the European Union, President Macron first, are criticizing the current status, the current situation in the NATO. And so this would increase, strengthen our inclination to do more for European more integrated security and defense strategy. So all those issues are closely interconnected. Then there is another number of burning issues that are affecting the humanity in the world of today. I would call the human factors that matter and matter a lot. First of all, the dignity of human beings, the dignity of every human being vis-a-vis -vis wars, insecurity and regional crisis, vis-a-vis -vis massive migrations. Italy is a country that knows better than others how dramatic is the massive migration phenomena and how important and I would say strong is the responsibility all the states bear to save human lives at need where they need to be rescued every single state has the responsibility to do it rescuing people in ICs, offering people a decent integration conditions in the state of destination, and so on and so forth. We would have liked, uh, as Italians, to see, to have seen Europe doing much more about that, about creating a true European migration and integration comprehensive strategy. This is not yet the case. And these are other issues to be dealt with urgently because we are not talking about numbers. We are talking about children, women, men whose destiny is at risk in many cases. Those are uh, human factors that are connected with economic crisis, perspectives of low growth and high unemployment. All these has a lot to do with what is the responsibility of Europe. Responsibility of Europe is not, of course, only to keep rigorous rules to be implemented. The responsibility of Europe is also to try to promote growth, jobs, to offer to the younger generations a better opportunity for their future. And finally, there is another number of extremely important issues, the European role on the global scene in the world. What is Europe doing to contribute to mitigate or solve many of the crises that are in our neighborhood. Frankly speaking, as, as I said, as strongly pro-European, I'm very sad when I see Europe absent, or rather absent, in crisis areas where Europe should be. The broader Middle East, Syria, Libya, the northern of Africa, all crisis areas where the disengagement of our American friends and the absence of Europe are giving other actors all the possibilities to play whatever they like to, to do. And this is frankly speaking for we Europeans that have been 
working in the history with the European soft power as a model to deal with serious crises, and we did it in the past with the success story of the Western Balkans, where after the dissolution of Yugoslavia, it was thanks to the European magnet that Europe was able to attract towards the West, towards European Union countries that are now proudly members of NATO, members of EU, or candidate to become one day members of our family. What is today the responsibility of Europe to deal with foreign crises and to help stabilizing regions where millions and millions of people are at risk and the security of large regions like Mediterranean, the region which is our neighborhood, is in a very chaotic situation with the turbulent situation in Libya, with the real risk of partition of Libya in two, if not in three, is the never-ending crisis in Syria with human beings that are suffering a lot and too much, with other countries that play a regional role, like uh, Turkey, which is playing an important role in coordination and in cooperation with Russia and Iran. What to do with Iran? Is there a real risk of proliferation in a crisis between Iran and Saudi Arabia, bringing those countries one day to proliferate towards a nuclear weapons? This is, would be a nightmare for all those living in the broader Middle East that you know much better than me. How's the situation in the big country, Egypt, that plays a role, a stabilizing role in the crisis and difficult situation be between Israel and Palestine, and nevertheless, even Egypt is unable to come to an end with that crisis and persuade, finally, Israel to mitigate their requests and sometimes their actions. All those issues are requiring more European presence, more European engagement. As I mentioned, within Europe, internal problems, strengthening the European institutions, having more capacity to deliver human factors, economic factors, security and international relation factors. All of these is what about the present and the future of Europe. These are, very in short, some of the topics with our excellent expert friends that are speakers here at this panel we count to address. I would, uh, since I talked about uh, the Western Balkans, I will start by Prime Minister Kosovo, Prime Minister of Croatia, a country that has suffered a lot after the dissolution of former Yugoslavia and now proudly full member of European Union member of NATO playing a very important role in this region. Prime Minister Kosovo, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nizami Ganjavi International Center. Thank you very much, um, of course, uh, Italian Society for International Organization. Uh, for this opportunity to be in Roma to, to talk with all of us um, about building peace, friendship, stability, and first of all, can we explain to ourselves that what Europe is? What is it we have in mind when we say Europe? For those of us living in the European Union, when we say Europe, 
We primarily have the EU in mind. Uh, we often forget that the term Europe is much wider and means a lot more than the European Union. Those are some of us reasons why it is not simple to answer the question of what the present of Europe is. And it is still harder to answer what its future is going to be like. Great Britain's departure from the EU will leave long-term consequences which will be difficult to predict for Europe, the European Union, and for the world uh, as a whole. Nothing will be the same anymore. Uh, what Brexit will produce and uh, the, the end of the day is something that few can clearly predict with any certainty at this moment. What is very important for EU present is that Brexit has not divided the other uh, 27 member countries. A high degree of loyalty, discipline and mutual respect was achieved here. Uh, politicians are responsible for creating the future and the present of states and people. Some of them are ordinary politicians and others are statesmen and brave people. They are statesmen because they are brave. I will count Angela Merkel in this moment as a statesman of Europe and the European Union who has marked an entire era in the life of European Union which has not been quite unproblematic. Angela Merkel is slowly departing uh, the political scene and her influence will completely vanish at one point. Are there new figures of authority which might move us forward uh, by the strength of their accomplishments? It's something that Europeans have been asking themselves. There is a whole generation of politicians departing from the European political stage. Both the President of the European Council and the entire European Commission. When he was talking over as uh, the President of the European Council in 2014, Donald Tusk said, Europe should protect its fundamental values, solidarity, freedom, unity against all threats to the EU and its cohesion. He then advocated leadership and political unity. This underpins my tests on leaders and brave people who, moves, who move the gold spots. The European Union is facing then the departure of an entire generation of politicians, staunch the European who leave open the issues of enlargement. President Macron, who has been a proponent uh, of the EU, is coming into view as one of those who are putting on the brakes. By stopping North Macedonia and Albania in their tracks on the path of the EU, an error has been made. Many agree superfi superficially. <clears throat> this error has open it up a discussion on the honesty of the dedication of EU members and their leaders to, through enlargement. One of the, the big issues, ladies and gentlemen, which are <clears throat> bordering the present of Europe and its union is the uh, migratory issue which cannot be resolved in a single way. Uh, what everybody agree on uh, is the principle of strictly guarding our southern borders from illegal crossings. All the all other questions, especially if Turkey leaves the door uh, with widely open the ref for refugees to pass through, will not have true answers. The European Union will be engrossed by the issue of migrations for years to come. And when it comes to the future, well, we, we, there will be no offering Europe without stable Western Balkans. And there will be no sovereign Europe without a stable and sovereign Ukraine. 
As the outgoing president of the European Council, Donald Tusk, Tusk sta stated it, uh, respect in the re that respect. Our strong and consistent stance towards Russia was the first clear and ambiguous expression of our sovereignty. The European Union must base its politics on compromises that much is clear. But there must be no retreat from the basic values on which the EU was founded, and that much is clear. These values are freedom, the rule of law, and dignity of every human, every individual. These values and the foundations of the European Union. These values must underpin EU's relations towards the big powers such as Russia, China and uh, the USA, each of them venting in their own way and with various interests to win over spaces of domination on Europe. And on the end, for Europeans, both for politicians and citizens, Europe must always be first. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Kozor, for this important highlight on Europe defending its fundamental values. And since we are talking about uh, key principles that, in my view, uh, I think it's shared view, are non-negotiable values, I turn to President Yushchenko. President Yushchenko has been playing a very important role in the development of his country. Ukraine has been going through extremely difficult also personal times. In that respect, Mr. President, how do you see the European role also in relation with your country's future perspectives? Uh, dear friends and colleagues, it's a great honor for me to speak on this subject. I am very pleased that no matter where we meet uh, during our uh, Nizami Ganjavi International Center events and missions, no matter which country hosts us, we always have these very interesting discussions about the most pressing issues and today we are discussing one of them, which is the future of Europe and which is uh, security in Europe. Те, що відбувається сьогодні в широкій Європі, мені здається, кожен розуміє, що ми надзвичайно багато втратили того почуття стабільності, яке ще 15-20 років у нас було. Uh, when I see uh, the events unfolding in Europe, I have this uh, feeling that we have lost this momentum of stability, a feeling of stability and consensus that we all remember existed in Europe back 10-15 uh, years ago. Ми чуємо кожен день мілітарну риторику. На сході Європи шість воєнних конфліктів, і в, і в жодному із цих конфліктів ми не бачимо ладу його завершення. Uh, every day we are hearing more and more of military rhetoric. We also know of six military conflicts unfolding on uh, the borders of Europe, and we see no possible resolution of each uh, one of those con conflicts whatsoever. We all know exactly what uh, are the reasons and why those uh, conflicts are in place. I don't think that here in this room we would not find a politician who would say that all those six conflicts are ethnical or 
local and uh, Europe is not a place where the uh, resolution of those conflicts should be discussed because they are purely national issues. We understand. Ethnica is not to do. Conflict is related. Conflict is outside. Aggression is brought to us. Are we talking about Nagorno-Karabakh, the Gruzia, or Ukraine? And no matter which part of Europe we take, Ukraine or Nagorno-Karabakh or Transnistria or Georgia, we all understand that all those conflicts and all those wars are artificial, imposed and brought in by some other party. Я повторюсь, на попередніх форумах ми давно домовилися про те, що не може бути безпекової політики німецької, австрійської, угорської, італійської чи іспанської. And in, in the formats of our discussions, we have long uh, time agreed that there is no such thing as a uh, German security model or Hungarian security model or French security model when you are talking about the future of Europe. І тому, що відбувається на Сході Європи, я глибоко переконаний, у європейських політиків повинна боліти не тільки голова, але й серце. And I strongly believe that when you see those conflicts unresolved, when you see these issues uh, arising and unfolding, all Europeans, uh, European politicians should worry about them, and they should not only worry in their minds, but they should also worry in their hearts. Я хотів би вам назвати п'ять сім цифр, які показують антологію гарячого конфлікту, який проводить окупаційна Росія по відношенню до України. And coming back to Ukraine, I would like to give you some numbers to illustrate the degree of the war, the degree of the conflict unfolding on the territory of Ukraine. І я думаю, що це аналіз, який повинен нас змушувати глибоко, серйозно замислюватись. And this is uh, something for all of us to consider and to think about. Окупація Росією українського Сходу і Криму почалася в лютому 2014 році. The occupation uh, of Ukraine by Russia, Crimea first and then mainland Ukraine started back in February of 2014. Через п'ять місяців російський бук збиває малазійський Боїн. Then in five months uh, the Russian uh, missile takes down the Malaysian Boeing. Через дев'ять місяців після початку конфлікту європейська спільнота народжує проект, який називається протокол по тимчасове перемир'я або Мінск-2. Then after uh, nine months since the beginning of uh, the war in Ukraine, Finally, the international community comes with this uh, peaceful negotiation format that is called Minsk II. У лютому 15-го року нормандський формат породжує протокол комплексу заходів щодо виконання Мінську II. Then we have uh, so-called Normandy format that back in uh, February of 2015 obliged uh, Ukraine um, to, uh, to comply with uh, means, so-called Minsk agreements. Одним словом, кінець жов... кінець оз... кінець 14-го року, початок 15-го року, це самі жаркі місяці були в європейських світових дебатах щодо реакції на російську агресію. So, uh, between 2014 and the beginning of 2015, uh, the situation in Ukraine and the hot uh, war military actions of Russia against Ukraine was the number one issue for the debates uh, in all European uh, important organizations. Then, uh, the next uh, point. Чотири місяці після того, як був підписаний нормандський формат, в Санкт-Петербургському економічному міжнародному форумі Росія сповіщає, що вона проголошує будівництво мегапроекту «Північний потік-2». And then if you remember uh, back uh, later in 2015, during the uh, economic forum in St. Petersburg, Russia declared the new mega project for Europe and Russia that is called Nord Stream 2. А через два місяці у Владивостоку на східному форумі Кремль 
підписує меморандум про розбудову «Північного потоку-2» і переуступку небачених в історії «Газпрому» Росії активів німецьким і австрійським компаніям. And then later in 2015 in Vladivostok Russia signs another memorandum with European countries uh, to actually launch Nord Stream 2 where Gazprom actually gives unprecedented benefits uh, and recession of assets to large German and Austrian companies involved in Nord Stream 2. Gazprom для Росії це свята корова. Because for uh, Russia Gazprom is a holy cow. Газпром до цього ніхто не входив. And Gazprom was something that Russia was guiding uh, especially well. Цим я хочу сказати, що в цей самий бурний час дискусії міжнародної по окупації України Крем знаходить ключі до Європи. So basically what I wanted to say is that during those most heated months of the war in Ukraine, Kremlin came up with this idea of how to work with Europe in other formats in order to satisfy uh, the public opinion in Europe and promote its image of um, you know, international and reliable partner. So all European institutions are affected by Kremlin's ability to find these proper keys proper corruption measures in order to reach its ultimate goal. Я переконаний, що північний потік 2 це хабар нормандцям тим колом політичним, які приймали названі вищі два рішення. So and we, in Ukraine we can only see that we can only consider Nord Stream 2 project a bribe of Russia to all those major countries involved in the Normandy format. І тому виникає декілька риторичних запитань. Запитання перше. Чому Північний потік-2 і обмін активами між німецькими та австрійськими компаніями став можливий тільки підписання в рамках нормандського формату порядку врегулювання російської окупації в Україні. Uh, rhetoric questions uh, like why uh, the Nord Stream 2 project allowed such an unprecedented exchange of assets between uh, German and, and Austrian companies and why exactly this happened right after the Normandy format wanted to uh, do something to regulate and resolve the conflict in Ukraine. Ви тут не відчуваєте бартеру? So to us in Ukraine it feels like a barter deal. Друге риторичне запитання. Чому після п'яти років існування Мінську-2 і порядку врегулювання, який виписаний е, нормандською групою, не виконаний жоден із десяти пунктів, які повинна виконати була Росія? And the next question. We have those Minsk agreements in place for five years and ten aspects, ten points of the Minsk agreement. Uh, Russia failed to comply uh, with at least one of them and failed to fulfill at least one of them. Why do you think that every six months in Europe is a question of the question of the question of sanctions against Russia? And nevertheless, each six months, the Europe still discusses the possibility of lifting and removing sanctions against Russia. Is it a delicate question of why the mission of OSCE is not possible на окупованій території. Or another question, why OSE mission is not allowed to enter the occupied areas of Donbass? Чому жодного разу місія ОБСЄ не допустили до огляду так званих гуманітарних конвоїв із Кремля? Why uh, OSCE is never allowed to actually look uh, in uh, and check what exactly is coming uh, from Russia to Ukraine through all those so-called humanitarian convoys. Я назвав ці запитання риторичними, тому що я переконаний, ви знаєте відповіді, чому так відбувається. I, I, uh, these questions are rhetoric because uh, you all know answers to them. Дії Кремля привели до того, що об'єднана Європа втратила солідарність. Uh, 
втратила солідарність не тільки по пан-європейських питаннях, але й по пан-атлантичних і східноєвропейських. Because, unfortunately, it is because of uh, the actions of Kremlin, uh, Europe lost a lot in terms of its solidarity, in terms of its pan-European or transatlantic projects. And the last thing I want to say, what is the moral of my speech that I want to bring to you? And my last point. We know well the truth about these conflicts that are happening on the West of Europe. I think we all know the nature of all those conflicts taking place uh, around Europe. Ми добре розуміємо європейську позицію, коли кажуть, що європейські хлопці не будуть воювати на українських, грузинських чи якихось інших кордонах. Obviously, uh, we understand why uh, and we do not expect European armies to fight on the borders of Europe on the lands that are Georgia or Ukraine or, uh, or Moldova. І ми це розуміємо. And we understand that it is not the job of the European... Uh, and that it is not the job of the European Union to protect those areas. We understand that, but we also understand that once we have solidarity and unity in Europe, this is what makes us strong. And as an economist, I would like to give you um, two numbers. 81% всієї нафти і газу, яка виробляє, яку виробляє Росія, реалізується в Західній Європі. Дві третини військового бюджету Росії складають виручка від нафти і газу, проданої в Європі. Of Russia are financed by the revenues coming from the sale of oil and gas. Я хотів, щоб у Європі було у пресічного європейця було нормальне людське відчуття, коли ти заправляєш свою машину, кожний літр бензину російського походження, чи кожний кубічний метр російського газу, який ти споживаєш. Це єдина форма фінансування окупаційної політики Росії на Гірному Карабасі, в Придністрові, в, Дон... в Криму, в Південній Осетії чи Абхазії. And I would like uh, the Europeans to keep in mind that every liter of oil, every uh, cubic meter of gas that Europe buys from Russia is used exactly for funding of those conflicts that are unfolding in Ukraine or in Nagorny Karabakh or in other areas of Europe. We can stay together and we stay invited, if we stay together and we stay united, we can achieve a lot. If we understand each other, and if we share the same view on those tragedies, so I wish that all of us share this understanding and this concept of future of security in Europe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Yushchenko, for your remarks. Um, I think uh, Europe should have a stronger interest on contributing to solve the crisis and the settlement processes you mentioned. I would like to highlight on this point the role of OSCE. We cannot deny OSCE is playing a quite important role in some of those frozen con conflicts or settlement process, whatever you can call it. And also, I, I'm myself directly involved since I'm playing as special representative of OSCE for Moldova Transnistria settlement process. I can tell you, Mr. President, I was uh, very happy to see already in three different uh, high-level meetings last year and this year the special representatives of Ukraine, Russia, European Union and the United States sit together and sign together documents. It is not the solution of the crisis, it is not the settlement of the process, but there is a common goodwill. Unite, uniting and solidarity, what you said, 
is one of the keys to succeed. It is a small example compared to the one of Ukraine and occupation of Crimea, but is an example showing that in some cases OSCE, with the strong push from European Union member states, can do something concrete and tangible. Uh, with that, I move to President Zatlers. President Zatlers, you have been President of Latvia, and you know all how important is the region of the Baltic countries and playing a role in security and, of course, on how to face the future of Europe and how to avoid the, 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 the risk of escalation of crisis at our eastern borders. And you know much better than many others what to do about that. President, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a member of Nizami Ganjavi International Center, I'm very proud to be here, and we are very grateful to uh, particularly Franco Frattini and other, other Italian friends uh, for arranging this uh, nice discussion. But, uh, yes, we have uh, a new elected European Parliament. We are expecting to have a commission next coming days, and we expect some European vision from these new elected politicians uh, and new elected commission. Yes, uh, everybody expects that, and, uh, including the politicians themselves. They are very enthusiastic, they think they are smarter, they think they are m much more decisive, and uh, they know what to do, except one thing. Pretty often I have uh, noticed that uh, the new elected politicians, yes, they have ideas, but they don't know exactly how to be successful with implementing the ideas. And that's why, because they don't even, you know, make analysis of the political history of the last decade, or of two decades, or maybe even 50, uh, 50 years since now. But uh, what is the problem? Uh, we always need vision. People expect that the politicians will have vision and decisive leadership. So if you look at the past of the Europe, you know, and we have the fathers of the European community idea. We've got a you know, successful European common market. We have implemented the you know, introduction of one currency, Euro. We have you know, implemented the free borders principle for the Schengen area. And we had a, a very good and, and very smart enlargement program of the Eastern Europe. That were the success stories. They brought a lot of things, uh, not in one day, but basically in a long run. And we see all these visions were implemented in a pretty good way, and we are happy to have them, the results today. But also the Lisbon Treaty was some kind of step forward. But if you look at the last decade, not too much. Okay, we had a lot of ad hoc decisions because. We had the financial crisis, we had Greece crisis, we had, you know, migrant crisis. So we tried to fix uh, these problems ad hoc and we were successful as Europeans. But it was not a visionary. It was not a vision to have, you know, one day migrants coming, you know, they just came one day. So the question is why we are now stick to the ad hoc decisions Maybe the, the, let's say, the processes are unpredictable, or the processes are too fast. Let's say the societies have changed. And if you look why we miss some leadership from Germany or from France, at present they have internal problems inside, and they are not pretty successful to, to solving these problems. And they are not prepared for the more complex societies, you know, and it, for example, Germany, usually, you know, social democrats, Christian democrats, and that's it. But today we have a multiple party system, and uh, there are voters uh, who really support these parties. And the Germans have to learn how to make a government in this situation, how to govern their country, how to take into account every, let's say, reasonable, you know, argument by their societies. The French have the same. 
uh, the French have the same. The yellow jacket is still there. And um, President Macron is trying his best, but the yellow jackets are still there. And I'll speak about Great Britain. Great Britain is still in the United European Union. Don't forget it. Brexit is a process. The fact is not that. The, 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 let's say the, they were not capable to solve the internal problems, and they solved it by the referendum, and they created more problems. And now they have to tackle these problems. So I would say we, we have the lack of, uh, of uh, vision because every nation at present has its own internal problems. And then we, it corresponds to that point that they, we don't have the European vision as a whole. So it's, it's good to talk about the Franco-German you know, access or, let's say, driving force, but if they have problems, they, they are, are not the very, very much effective driving force. And if you look at the enlargement process, you know, there was a nice term, enlargement fatigue. It's still there, because these are not the smart decisions the, the Europeans made in Brussels uh, uh, recently. You know. They were not smart decisions, because the internal fatigue creates a Euro EU fatigue, and it creates fatigue towards you know, enlargement. Everybody knows that enlargement is the only way to go, but they can't say that they have the vision how to do that. And then comes a very big problem. For example, if you look at the whatever, Northern Macedonia, Albania, if European Union gives them a road map and a definite goal, membership, and starts the negotiations, the whole nations of Northern Macedonia and Albania will start working on this purpose. Whether, sometimes very painful process. Sometimes they will be very angry, you know, but they have the goal and they have the roadmap. Just saying we are not going to give you a roadmap is pushing these societies into such confusion. Where to go? Maybe there are another alternative to European Union. And that's not a smart, smart decision. So, but that's the present situation about the security. Of course, uh, for Europe, the internal security is a little bit different than the outer security. That means anti-terrorism. What it means? Sharing information in between the secret services. How to manage this information. How to make safe the whole Europe. Not just one city or one country. So, but it brings also to, to some, you know, giving away some uh, sovereignty from the member states. It also makes... Uh, a situation when individuals have to give away some of their privacy towards the common goal. So this is a change, but we have to explain the, the, uh, to the population that this change is absolutely necessary. If you look at the, uh, the migrant crisis, what it showed, we didn't think about the outer borders. Even more, we don't really understand where is the outer border. Where is Romania uh, uh, and Bulgaria? Are they in? Or are they out? At present, they are half in, half out. If you talk about the protection of the external borders. So you have, we have to really work to get every country in the Schengen. And then we know this is our outer border, and this is our common burden, how we protect the outer borders. Because it's terrorism, this is an international crime, it's smugglers, and it's migration, uh, illegal migration. How to convert it into a legal migration? With the military, uh, let's say, security and the military threats, you know, you know, where the threats come from? Basically, if you look around the Europe, you know, we think the threats come from Russia. So we have to focus on our policies towards Russia to make proposals from our side how to decrease the, the stakes of this threat. But uh, basically, we have the answer. NATO. And NATO has been successful as a collective uh, defense organization, and this is a military organization, and this burden we share all together, 2% is, an, is, is a good idea, because it makes us to believe our, our allies. And uh, if somebody started to talk about the European army, the first question for me is, what do you mean by that? And nobody could answer. Nobody could answer. And this is a, a very risky uh, action by the politician to say we are going to create European army without knowing what is that. 
So basically, I think we have to work on a uh, better relationship between NATO and EU. Political and military organizations should work together very closely. And we see in my case, as you, as you mentioned in Baltics, you know, we have the high NATO presence. And we have, you know, soldiers, and uh, we had a parade a couple of weeks ago. And there were, you know, soldiers of Montenegro, soldiers of Slovenia, soldiers of Albania marching together because the problem of the outer military threat is there. It's not in Balkans. In Balkans, it's a local internal threat. And this is what I want to say to this audience and think about the lessons learned. And I finish with that thing. We always don't pay too much attention to the details. Who was the nation who really destroyed the constitution of the European Union? Who remembers? We have forgotten. French. They voted against. Who was the leader of the European Union who you know, signed the Lisbon Treaty six or seven hours later than the others? Nobody remembers that. That was Gordon Brown from Great Britain. So we have to learn from the lessons of the history. And then we, our vision will be implemented with full strength and with success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. President, for touching upon the most burning issues in Europe today and tomorrow, and particularly for underlining the difficulties of many of the governments to understand the complexities of our societies, mentioning some movements, and also for not hiding the, I would say, increasing difficulties in those countries that has, have al always the ambition to be the driving force in Europe, particularly France and Germany, that have their internal difficulties, also in proposing solution for the future of Europe. And, and with that, uh, I move to my compatriot, Professor Linda Lanzilotta. Linda, you have been Vice President of the Italian Senate as well as expert on foreign policy and, like me, always very much pro-European integration. What is your opinion about the current state of play now in Europe? Thank you, Franco. And first of all, let me give the welcome to the Senate. Uh, was I was Vice President uh, till two years ago, and this marvelous building and. Uh, uh, salad zuccheri, which is all covered with frisco, which are very, very beautiful. So, coming to the, the point, uh, I heard about the difficulties in terms of integration and relationship between um, Europe and uh, uh, Eastern countries, but uh, I uh, want to remember uh, to ourselves and to, uh, to you, in that uh, Europe is put in discussion and is under attack even in Western countries of European Union and even in the countries which were funders of European Union. Uh, and so we have to remember uh, very often which were the which are the achievement uh, of European Union. Uh, uh, union since uh, uh, the, um, its beginning. Uh, we achieved uh, the larger liberal democracy. The uh, European Union has uh, 500 million of people which live in a liberal democracy. Uh, the larger area of fair and free commerce, which is uh, uh, which has been the factor of growth and welfare in Europe during uh, the last decades. We uh, create the uh, most advanced um, welfare state. The uh, area of uh, Europe has covered with protection in terms of assistance, <coughs> of health care, of uh, pensions at a level which is unknown uh, in, in the world. Uh, 
our position in terms of geostrategy, but on this point I will come uh, again after, is the uh, multilateralism, which has been an element of stabilization even at global level. And we uh, created um, monetar monetary union, and now we have a more and more increasing role of euro in terms of global economy. So uh, we, we uh, have never to, to forget all this, especially we have to remember uh, to new generation. We are uh, very often um, uh, involved in a different uh, um, talk, a talk of unsuccess and inefficiency of Europe. But we have, um, and uh, even the president of Latvia um, uh, remember that in, during the last 10 years, Europe uh, was more and more inefficient in terms of solving the problem of society, of uh, citizens, for migration, for unemployment, for economic growth. And this today put in discussion even the, uh, the role, the existence in some countries, in, in some sectors of the politics uh, of uh, um, European uh, Western countries in Italy, in France, in, even in Germany. Uh, because the, the uh, economic crisis started in the United States in 2008, um, mixed with the crisis produced by uh, global uh, increases of technology, um, uh, created a, a, a new situation where uh, Europe was too weak and was unable to tackle uh, uh, ef uh, efficiently and timely uh, to, to, to the new situation. And unemployment and migration, which put in discussion uh, from, the European, from the European point of view even the um, identity because, uh, as Fukuyama uh, which uh, you probably know says is a matter of uh, dignity and when you uh, have people who lose uh, their dignity because they lose uh, uh, their job and their uh, houses uh, you uh, feel to be attacked in your identity so all these new um, uh, situation created by the different aspect of crisis um, uh, may uh, make uh, a uh, emerging uh, um, uh, a feeling anti-Europe and an emerging of new nationalism which are very very dangerous for the stability of all the Europe so we have to start uh, from this point, and uh, the point uh, on the contrary is that the new parliament, uh, the new commission, have, a, a, I think, a stable majority in favor of a Europe which has to go ahead. So we, we have to go more and better, and where? Um, I think the, 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 the first point is in, in terms of uh, geostrategic role of Europe which is uh, solicited by all the present at this table. And uh, uh, this, w because the uh, geostrategic uh, role of Europe is important, very important, even for its economic growth, because if Europe is now in this period attacked for, uh, by uh, Western and Eastern um, uh, stronger states and uh, uh, is not the case. Is the case because is, uh, Europe is the large economy in the world, is the larger market. So uh, there are very, very strong interests to weaken Europe, to uh, weaken his um, cohesion, his stability, and uh, is the advancing of uh, European politics, uh, all, uh, the, the own European politics. And this is this point which we, we have to um, have very clear in mind because uh, the, the 
uh, the, the uncertainty uh, uh, in, uh, with countries like Ukraine or Latvia or Moldavia are all the, um, uh, the fruit of uh, this difficult phase of foreign policy of Europe and uh, the role of Europe has to be strengthened in terms of geostrategic um, vision. Uh, this is the vision which ha we have to give again to Europe and geostrategic um, address and uh, uh, guidelines are the basis of the, um, of the vision we have to rebuild for the new Europe of, the, of this century. Uh, the, the, the other um, um, point uh, on which we have to work and to do more and better is monetary union. We are now discussing in Italy, especially there is a huge discussion about uh, banking union, which is a pillar for the stability, because in the past the bank crisis was one of the factors which put in discussion the role of Europe for many, many citizens which were involved in the bank crisis. crisis. And uh, this is another point uh, which uh, see the different countries on different uh, sides of the, uh, of the position. Uh, but we have also a great perspective because the, uh, Europe is the country which is doing uh, more and better in terms of energetic transition and in terms of a great plan of investments for the um, uh, new economy, the carbonizing new economy and green economy for uh, tackling uh, um, uh, climate, uh, uh, climate change <coughs> and it's not a And it's not the case if the United States uh, uh, were uh, uh, out from the Paris agreements. <coughs> and if uh, Russia and China are so slow in the um, uh, new perspective, we have to change <coughs> the entire global economy. And this is the, uh, is the role of uh, uh, Europe. Uh, we, we have the most uh, engaged uh, politics uh, and policies for climate change. <coughs> Sorry for the... But uh, I would say another point very, very <coughs> important for our public opinion is migration. And uh, uh, we heard how the uh, migration flows are managed <coughs> in terms of pressure so on political um, on public opinion on the single countries this is a point very crucial for uh, the um, uh, consensus uh, in favor of Europe and this is the point which is uh, uh, used very strongly by anti-euro forces to underline the incapacity of uh, Europe to solve the uh, migration problems. And uh, last but not least, to do all this in a more efficient way, <coughs> we have a great, great problem of uh, European governance. <coughs> we, we, we know that uh, the uh, unanimity has been a, uh, a limit for the capacity of Europe to go ahead. And this point, we, I, I uh, think we, uh, we have to discuss <coughs> because a, a more uh, a, a huge capacity of doing also in terms of majority and on unanimity, I think it is necessary, necessary if we want to uh, achieve new uh, goals. 
I know that it is a very delicate point, but I think we have to pause on the table uh, and uh, uh, tackle and discuss and uh, to have something to do with this. Sorry for the, my... Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> I Professor. I cannot speak anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lanzilot. <coughs> Dear Linda, uh, listening to you, I was thinking about uh, how much we take Euro for granted every day, uh, how less we reflect about uh, the <coughs> cost of not having more Euro. We used to consider Euro as an achievement taken for granted, but what about if not would it be European integration on these, these, these? So that kind of reflection, especially uh, in the younger generations, happens not so often as it should be. And with that, our last speaker, President Ivanov. President, you have been 10 years the president of North Macedonia. Uh, Republic of Macedonia. Republic of, of North Macedonia. President of North Macedonia. The president of North Macedonia, you were the president of Republic, Republic of, Macedonia of Macedonia for 10 years. Ten years. Uh, so, listening to you with uh, enormous expertise as a statement, and uh, I like to say, as a professor, as a historian, has Europe still the role of magnet in your country? Thank Please. you, Mr. Pratini. Thank you of the Nizavi Ganjavi International Center of this very, very important uh, meeting in one special moment of the history of European Union, of the difficult period of European Union. Uh, I think this is my opinion. Many institutions of European Union still is in the 20th century, <laughs> and now we need new vision, new idea, maybe new institution how to survive in the 21st century because the European Union is the really best project in human history. This is the peace project, project of prosperity. But now we need idea, maybe institution, how the European Union to be a geopolitical actor in the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, my speech is Macedonian language. My assistant will translate to English, and I will start uh, with uh, this idea of the peace. Da se gradi Evropa, znači da se gradi mir, veleše tatkoto na moderna Evropa, Jean Monnet. Evropa vekjat 75 godini žive evo mir. To je najdolg period na mir od sete istorije na kontinentot. Kontinentot od kade započna dvete svetske vojni so milijonski žrtvi. Vo jedna prilika Helmut Kohl za minovajke od funkcijata kancelar na Germanija, ki je predupredi deka to je posledni od germanski lider koji živel vo vreme na vtorata svetska vojna i gdje doživel užasite predizvikane od ta vojna. Vo negoviot avtorski tekst vo vesnik od bilo 2012-a, ki se osvrne na faktot deka poradi aktuelnite krizi, da neštite generacije na lideri nema da go negovat po vojeni od eksperiment na evropska doverba ќе истекна дека со сите оние кои се прашуваат која е корист од единството на Европа, одговорот е еден и единствен, тоа е миро. Цитирајки го Моне и Кол, сакав да ја отворам дилемата за тоа колку се свесни денешните лидери за последиците, доколку во 21-от век исчезне европското единство, а со тоа и мирот во Европа. Ова пред се, затоа што повоените генерации израсна сметајќи дека мирот е нешто нормално, а војната е нешто што се случува на друго место, или нешто што се случува во минатото, или пак во најло случај се случува на периферијата на Европа, некаде на Балканот, Блискиот исток или Северна Африка. To create Europe is to create peace, said the father of modern Europe, Jean Monnet. Europe has already been living in peace for 75 years. This is the longest period of peace in the entire history of the continent, continent where the two world wars began taking millions of casualties. On one occasion, Helmut Kohl, while leaving the post of Chancellor of Germany, would warn that he is the last German leader that lived in the course of the Second World War, 
and experience the terror caused by that war. In his per personal writing for the newspaper built in 2012, he turns to the fact that due to the current crisis, the present generation of leaders will not foster the post-war experiment of European trust. He highlights that for all those asking what benefits Europe unity brings, the response is one and only, the peace. By quoting Monet and, Ke and Cole, I wish to pose the dilemma over how aware are today's, today's leaders of the consequences if the European unity disappears in the 21st century and with it the peace in Europe. Foremost, because the post-war generations grew up considering that the peace is something normal and the war is something that is happening in other places or something that was happening in the past, Alternatively, in the worst case scenario, it is happening along the periphery of Europe, somewhere in the Balkans, the Middle East or North Africa. The 75 years of peace in Europe have created a perception that Europe is a post-conflict region at, and that it can remain as such in the future. However, the current events in Europe and its surroundings indicate that multiply, multiply conflicts brew under the surface and that the future of Europe is becoming increasingly, increasingly unpredictable. Brexit, radicalism, extremism, terrorism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, all these are just the symptoms, not the causes of the current condition of Europe. Bismarck, seemingly aware of the conditions and rivalities in the Europe back in the 19th century, would deliver a prophecy that will be fulfilled. In his opinion, the Great War will come out of some foolish thing in the Balkans. Such foolish things are not occurring only in the Balkans anymore, but in many other places across Europe. Following the Second World War, the warrants overcome that after so many centuries of wars and conflicts between the countries in Europe, only one supreme power that would guarantee the peace and would lead to unity and unification of the continent should be accepted. Exhausted from wars and guarantees of their security, the European, the European leaders accepted the role of the American army in being the only one supreme power alongside which they created NATO. After the security guarantees of the past of the USA, the European leaders embarked on an amazing experiment, experiment that required from the European countries to believe one another. That experiment is referred to today as the EU. It all began with the opportunity for France and Germany to lock each other tightly in a friendly embrace, an embrace so close that neither one of them would set loose a hand to strike the other. Everything worked extraordinarily, creating one of the largest economies in the world, a superpower of lifestyle, and the USA were always there to meditate the resolution of the European disagreements and crisis. We are witnessing that the cohesion that existed for so long seems to be disappearing. A geostrategic vacuum is being created and carries the risk of unpredictable international disturbances. The last statements of the French President Macron and the behavior of Germany towards such attitudes and initiatives indicates that without the necessary overhaul, both the EU and the NATO may become either non-functional or irrelevant in the 21st century. Will the NATO summit, which will be held in London next week, offer a response to the stress, and the stress, the stress test conducted by Macron? In Macron's opinion, Europe cannot be strong and sovereign without certain and independent security policy. It is not this statement already suggesting that the discussions in London will be focused on the post-American future of Europe and what would, what would the consequences be of this disturbance of the transatlantic relations. Especially considering the fact that this is happening in a period when the cohesion and the mutual trust inside the EU is already flat faltering. The Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, has scheduled a meeting with Macron in Paris tomorrow. Probably this will be an attempt to overcome the disharmony already existing among the NATO members. However, let us remember that everything that is happening today with the relations between the EU, NATO, USA began in 2008 
at the NATO summit in Bucharest. Therefore, the person wishing to discover the reasons behind the current situation needs to start researching precisely into that NATO summit. Then came the Ukraine crisis in 2014, the migrant crisis in 2015, the wave of terrorist, terrorist attacks across Europe, which endangered the political, economic, and security stability of the EU. In 2016, the Brexit happened, imposing itself as a new geopolitical challenge to the EU. In 2014, Jean-Claude Juncker, being the new president of the EC, revealed that there will be no new enlargement of the EU and would repeat the same in 2017. These statements were a reflection of the great crisis that weakened the inter institutional structure of the EU. The, the enlargement process of the EU toward the Western Balkans was considered the best but also the most successful European policy for a long time. However, with the decision of France to veto the process of awarding a date for opening a session negotiation for Macedonia and Albania to the EU, the Western Balkans enters a new uncertainty. uncertainty. Instead of the promised political stability and economic prosperity, several Balkan countries, due to opposing interests of the great powers, may generate a permanent instability all over again. Nevertheless, regarding the security risk, much more concerning that the attitude of the EU toward the Western Balkans is the attitude of the EU toward the Middle East and the Arab world. A month ago, on October 29th and 30th, to be exact, the EU-Arab World Summit was held in Athens, titled A Strategic Partnership. It is worth knowing what the Secretary General of the Arab League, the Egyptian diplomat Ahmed Abul Gaid, said at the summit. Please get away from the Arab world. We have suffered enough. Such as he stressed himself, his message is directed to anyone that attempts to intervene in the Arab world, calling on them to cease what they are doing, since they are doing the, the, they are not helping anymore, but only make the bad situation worse. In his opinion, the Arab Spring was no spring, but an Arab destruction. The attitude of the EU toward Africa was the aspect of security is also concerning. By 2050, Africa will have 2.5 billion people. 50% of them will be young people to the age of 25. Therefore, the EU requires comprehensive partnership with Africa regarding the economic development and migration management, which will exist throughout our life and the life of several future generations. By 2030, in order to keep living in peace, Europe would also need to establish both national and European sovereignty in trade, in defense, in the digital sector. The EU mission for the 21st century is to promote progress and stability, balanced economic and social development, and to preserve the diversity of the peoples in Europe. Maintaining and nurturing its values, such as respect for human rights, social mar market economy, sustainable development, healthy environment. Whether it will succeed or become the victim of greedy interests between the powerful members of the European core will depend on the courage of its leaders to position Europe as a geopolitical actor in the 21st century. However, there is one large trap on the road of achieving all that. Europe remains trapped in the space between the past that it wishes to overcome and the future that it, that it has not defined yet. Or, as Jacques Leclerc would say, it is equally important both to Europe and to the Balkans. We have had thousands of yesterdays, but only one shared tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, we are coming to be close to the conclusion. I got a request from the audience, Amre Moussa, long-serving Secretary General of Arab League and Foreign Minister of Egypt. Amre, you have the floor. A micro, please. Some, someone could pass the micro to Professor Moussa. Thank you. Mr. 
question is very simple. I listened carefully to you and the rest of the panel. I didn't hear any observation about the link between the European Union and the Mediterranean. We both work together on the issue of the Mediterranean policy, European, uh, European Union cooperation with the rest of the uh, countries uh, of the Mediterranean. Of course, I listened carefully to what the President, uh, former President of Macedonia has said uh, about part of it. But the time has come for Europe to look around. It's not only the problems within the European Union or around the European Union in Europe, but again, the neighborhood policy, the Mediterranean policy that should, in fact, when we are in Italy, and Italy has an important role in this uh, issue of the Mediterranean policy. The time has come, I believe, to revive the uh, Barcelona Agreement and even update it to chart a new form of cooperation in light of the developments that we have all lived uh, and also to uh, talk about or to plan for the 20s. We have a new decade coming up and it uh, by necessity uh, would behoove us to sit together and talk about the Mediterranean policy. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Amr. I, I agree fully with you as, you, as you mentioned. We have been working also together many years on how to make of Mediterranean a clear priority. Uh, I hope that in the near future, especially if there will be the establishment of a new convention for the future of Europe, this Euro-Mediterranean policy will be once again one of the key priorities. We run the risk to lose sight completely. I said before in some of my remarks, very sadly I consider the absence of Europe from crisis areas as well as from Mediterranean region as a whole, where Europe has historical and current reasons to be fully engaged, especially, I would say, in a moment where our historical allies, the United States, are showing disengagement day after day. So it's the moment of Europe, especially in the southern dimension. We have been working very much on the eastern and northern dimension, uh, a bit less on the southern dimension. So I agree completely. I, I, I think uh, during the panel in this, uh, this afternoon, it, you will be also able to address this issue while talking about security in Mediterranean, especially in Mediterranean region. Um, I think uh, we have to close uh, now. Um, I thank you all for participating to this first panel for your speeches, your remarks. I would like to close by quoting one of the founding fathers of European Union, uh, President De Gasperi. By the way, President De Gasperi, since you will be working tomorrow in the headquarters of SIOI, is the leader who established SIOI 75 years ago. He decided to establish SIOI to create the negotiating entity to negotiate the accession of Italy to the United Nations. It was in 45, Italy became member in 55. In 10 years, the COI at that time has been negotiating the accession. And I'm very happy to say that because uh, President De Gasperi, in the opening of the presentation of his first government to the Parliament of Italy, said in conclusion, since some of you mentioned the politicians, the normal politicians, he said, a politician looks at the next elections, while a statesman looks at the next generations. Yes. All what we said yes. is exactly in that phrase. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right.
tricky chair. Yeah, okay. very tricky. Uh, please, if you stay on the podium for a family photo. Yeah. Yeah.